I make my money on that one, man. I make my money on that one. I got to look. Stop asking questions, man. Just talk. Man. Oh, man. So you didn't. You Don't worry about nothing. Up, yeah, nobody messing up. I got everything in there. Now you move that way a little bit. You, you move, actually move this way a little bit. Yeah, look, right there. Man, look. There you go. There you go. Bingo. Stay right there. You ready to talk? Look, man. The microphone is live, man. The microphone is live. Look, man. Man, you good. You good. I'm looking through this. Don't worry about that. You looking about that? Yeah. Look at this. <laughs> man. 111 shows, bro. A hundred and eleven shows, man, and this is what I, I'm subject to. You got your I'm subject to this. Look at that. That's all you need to worry about right there. That's all you need to worry about. Let me handle this. Man, that, Let me handle this. <laughs> Let me handle this. <laughs> man, that thing look. <laughs> hey, man. I'm a, hey, boy. Uh, oh man, that's the old days. It sounds so good. Yo, yeah, oh Lord. <laughs> oh, I feel like I want to hear it one more time. No, you don't. Go ahead and talk. One yeah. more time. Good evening, yeah. good evening, good evening, good evening. This is your host, Joaquin Thompson, coming to you live from Snellville. No, 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 no. Close no, to Atlanta. No. Coming to you live from close to Atlanta. Right outside of Atlanta, we in uh, Snellville, Georgia. No, we're not. Liburn. Where we at? Liburn. Oh man! Oh man! You keep talking. Man. You want to go back to the other place? Live no, right? Live man. Right? That's even further out the country, yeah. man. All right, so we closer to Atlanta. We in Lilburn. Yeah. There you right. Go. So we in Lilburn. So welcome to episode one eleven. Mm. So ooh, that's a number. Yeah, yeah to man. play that number one one one. So we at episode one eleven. We doing our thing. We only uh, eighty nine shows from two hundred. Right. We always looking to the future, right? But um, great show in, in store for you tonight. We're gonna talk about some some different things that's going on in the world, and some stuff that we need to be aware of because this show is to educate, motivate, and elevate you to make some changes in your financial life so that way you can change the trajectory of where you're going with your money, right, in life in general, and just making sure that you're putting all those pieces in place so that way you're cognizant of what's going on in the world and knowing how to manage through it. So. We're going to jump right in. So those of you that are joining for the first time, my name is Joaquin Thompson Sr. I'm the host of the Daily Bread Show. The reason we say the Daily Bread Show because we have different platforms. We got a TV show. We got a radio show. We got podcasts. We got teaching. We got all the YouTube. So we just say show. So that way, everybody that don't get confused, I thought you said it was the radio show. I thought you, No, it's the Daily Bread Show. And on the Daily Bread Show, what we do is we talk about personal finance from a spiritual perspective a lot of times I get tongue-tongue when I'm saying that from a spiritual perspective 
And the reason we say from a spiritual perspective is because we don't do religion on the Daily Bread show. The reason we don't do religion is when you start doing religion, things can get a little that's uh, cloudy. I guess that's messy, right? So we want to keep everything nice, clean, succinct, so that way the information that I give to you is, is what I call bite size. It's something that you can take in, digest, and get to moving on it right away. You don't have to go home, think about it, analyze it, research it, look it up. Is it this? You can take this information and go right out and put it in play, and then everything will work out for you if you start working on it. And that's the hardest part, just start. That's the hardest part. So just get started, making things happen, and then you know that's when things are changing in life. So tonight, a couple of things I want to talk about tonight. I've been thinking about it, doing some research this week. The first one is, I would be remiss if I don't go here. So I got to go here first. The number to the station, 678-381-1973. 678-381-1973. So you can call in with a comment. You can call in with you know information. You can call in with a question. You can call in and ask for some clarification. Because tonight, the first thing we're going to have to talk about is the official today, right? Is the official launch of our new mortgage company, mm -hmm. JL Capital. Come on, right? Mm -hmm. So with the launch of the, I've been getting a lot. Of, I posted in you know social media this morning, and I wanted people to know right off the bat, you know, Instagram and Facebook, and I haven't put anything out on YouTube. You like Twitter? But Twitter? Yeah, I, I'm not a big Twitter. I'm not a big Twitter. Not a Twitter -ist. I'm not a Twitterist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I was doing it, then I kind of fell off. And I, I need to get back on. I'll get back on Twitter, but I haven't done a Twitter. But I did. I did do Facebook. Huh? How many followers you got on Twitter? Probably about two or three. <laughs> I got more than you. <laughs> no, you don't. No, you don't. You're crazy, man. You're I got crazy. A list. You ain't got, you probably got two, love, you probably man. got two or three yourself, man. Somebody swing some love. Oh, that's my, hey, that's my lovely wife, man. Hey, the rock, as they call it, the rock, you know, looking out for all of us, all, everybody at T5, so kudos to my, to my lovely wife. And, um, but the thing about, yeah, so I, I launched the mortgage company. So a lot of people say, hey, man, I didn't know you had a mortgage company. I didn't have it. I was putting things in place, putting the infrastructure in place, getting all the licenses done, getting everything making sure all the team was in place. So now we got the underwriters in place, we got the, the loan assistance in place, we got the admin assistance in place, we got everything in place in order for us to provide top-notch quality service, top-notch quality customer service from anyone that needs either a purchase, a loan for a purchase, a refinance, uh, you may want to get into some investing, maybe want to buy some commercial real estate. Mm -hmm. So we have products for different needs. We have different types of products. So today, um, I was talking to one of my business associates and he was saying that it would be good if I went over the highlights of the mortgage process. Like we're not gonna get into the weeds, we're not gonna get into VA, FHA, conventional, non-conventional, jumbo, non-jumbo. We're not gonna get into that because I think that would be too into the weeds. But we're gonna talk about it at a high level because many people, and I i mean, I knew this, but it's, it's something about when you hear it. Many people don't understand the process. So tonight, we're going to talk about the process, the mortgage process at a very high level. But it's going to be, again, something that's bite-sized, digestible, that you can take and use right away. So with that being said, let's talk about just what's going on in the country. The Fed, right? The Federal Reserve. Everybody heard this. Whether you were looking for a mortgage, not looking for a mortgage, yesterday, the Fed cut the interest rate by 0.25%. Mm. That was the first time that the Fed had cut the rate, the interest rate, since 2008. So you may be sitting at home saying, well, what does that mean for me? That means that you can get money cheaper, mm -hmm. right? You can get money cheaper. You got an opportunity so if you were already looking or thinking about buying a house, or thinking about like, hey, this is the time for me to get some property, this would be the time for you to take advantage of it because the loans are cheaper. We got cheaper products now. So with that being said, we're going to start off at the top, and I'm just walking through the process of 
what happens when you are going to get a loan, when you need to get a loan, and when you're trying to work through getting a loan. So first thing is, what typically happens is you're out, because most people, not so much they don't plan, they just, they don't plan far in advance, right? So what will happen is, <laughs> so what will happen is, what happened is, you you know, people will go out and they'll find a house. Ain't got to move. I ain't got to what? Ain't got to move. There you go. Look, I can just swivel right into yeah, it. Man, what you trying to say? Man, well, give me a pen. Give me a pen. Give me a paper, man. I'll write. You know I like writing on whiteboards anyway. Let me see, man. I might just write something anyway. So let me just. What's your name, man? You know what I'm saying? Let me put my name up here, man. Look, I'm going to do it like this, man. So that way everything is still. I don't want to snatch nothing out. But look at this. Oh, this is nice, man. Look, 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 look. So this is you. No, I'm a joke. I'm joking. <laughs> so I'm going to just do a one. Step one. So let's talk about the first step in the process is you want to go out and you, you, you know, you go, I'm going to just put realtor because this is really where it starts at, right? So you got your realtor. And the reason I put realtor first is because when you say you got the realtor, Man, I don't, I don't want to make it fall. I'm just trying to make it, make it turn around, man, so they can see it. All right, there we go. So, um, first thing you got is your realtor. So what happens is people go out, and you want to start the process of buying a house. The first thing you're gonna need is a realtor. But here's the, here's the, here's where the mortgage comes in, and the way the industry has changed over the years. In order for you to go and see a house now, right? Before a realtor would take the time, put you in their vehicle. The first question is going to be this, prequal, right? So the first question they're going to ask you, do you have a pre-qualification letter? That's question number one. Even though it's step number two, it's question number one. Because the first thing the realtor is going to hit you with before they even let you get in the car, before they say, hey, we're going to go out and look at some houses or we're going to look at some property. First thing they're going to ask you, do you have a pre-qualification letter? Now, if you say, no, I don't have a pre-qualification letter, the next step they're going to tell you is this. Call a lender. And I'm going to just put call lender. Because that is going to be the next step. Call a lender. Now, what typically happens is the realtor already has a relationship, so I'm going to just draw a little arrow, to the lender, right? The reason they have a relationship already with the lender is because the realtor does what? The realtor sells houses. And what does the realtor need? The realtor knows that they need to have a relationship with a lender that can get the deal done. Right? So in order to get the deal done, you have to take the person through the loan process. So when they say, the realtor is going to say, call Jane Doe, or call John Doe, or call this person, or call that person, right? So what I did was, as I sat back and I was researching this and watching how this process went, this was a few years ago, I was like, you know what? This would be a good place to insert a mortgage company because a lot of realtors, they... And this is, my, this is my personal opinion. They arbitrarily just send you to a person that they know can close a loan. But that person, just taking it back a notch, but that person may be at a Wells Fargo. They may be at Rocket Mortgage. They may be at, you know, some other big bank, Bank of America. But here's the thing I was thinking about. If the realtor just says, call, you know, James over at Wells Fargo, the realtor has a relationship with James, but I'm thinking big picture. Because that's what we do on the Daily Bread Show. So I'm thinking about, if they refer you to Wells Fargo, does Wells Fargo, do they, I mean, do they make any investments in my community? Are they really helping people in my community? Or is there an opportunity here for you to create something where you could, one, start to process some of these loans after you've established a relationship with the realtor, and two, also be in a position to invest in your local community. Because a lot of these banks that they refer to, they're out of state, Rocket Mortgage is, I mean, they're nationwide, but 
It's somebody you're not going to see. It's going to be on a computer. But it's, it's, it's getting away from relationship. Relationship with the realtor, but then also the relationship with the potential buyer. So that's where JL Capital, let me write this up here. So this is now you have a trusted lender in JL Capital, right? So JL Capital, you can go to jelllecapital.com. That's our website. You can go to jelle on Facebook. You can go to jelle capital on Instagram and Facebook because I left the capital off. J E L L E is pronounced J L Capital. And look up all of the different products that we have there. So once you, you know, once the realtor tells you to reach out to the lender, and now the lender is our company, J L Capital, what we'll do then is we'll do this. We'll work with you to get your pre qual letter, right? So we're going to write step number four. Prequal letter, I'll just say verification, right? Because there's some steps that's going to go into, or a process that goes into the prequal verification. Now, prequalification is different than pre approval. Pre approval and pre qualification. So let's, let's stop there and then we're going to do a little, what I call a delineation. So this is pre-qualification versus pre-approved, right? So in pre-approved, what happens when you get, let's start with pre-qualification. Pre-qualification is really when you go through a process and they ask you to put in all of your information, your demographics, how long you've been on your job. They, have, they may ask you about some tax returns. Um, not initially, but they may, and they definitely gonna ask you your income and they typically will pull your credit. A lot of lenders will pull your credit to get you the pre-qualification because they want to make sure that you're qualified to purchase whatever you're starting to look at. The other thing that the pre-qualification is going to do, it's going to tell you the amount that the lender has approved you for. So that means that you can go through your pre-qualification process and they may come back and say, hey, you approved for 125000 or you prove for $225,000 based on your credit, based on how long you've been on your job, based on your income. And that's before they get into what I call the hard documents. And we're going to get into that in a minute. That's pre-qualification. Pre-approved, pre-approved means that they take it a step further. They may ask you for some documents up front like tax returns, right? Your last three months of pay stubs. So they'll go through the process, they haven't gone through the entire underwriting process, but they'll go through 90% of the process, see the documents, review them, verify your income, verify how long you've been in on your job or in that industry, verify your credit score, so they pulled your credit as well. So now they're like 90% sure that they can approve you for X amount of money. So what happens then, either pre-qualification or pre-approved, the lender's going to let you know how much house you approve for. So let's just say they say, oh, you approved for $200,000, right? So when you get approved, let's say $200,000. I don't know what's up with these markers, man. I'm going to get some new markers, bro. Can't have a whiteboard and don't have markers. So then when you get, oh, uh, that's much better. Oh, uh, that's much better. So once you get your pre-approved amount of $200,000, then what happens is that communication goes back up here to the realtor. So the communication, you know, the lender will reach back out to the realtor and let the realtor know. They'll also reach out to the potential client and let the potential client know as well. Say, hey, you've been pre-approved for $200,000. Or you, here's a pre-qualification letter for $200,000. So that means this. While you're out looking at houses, there's no need. There's no need in looking at all those really pretty houses that you want that exceed $200,000 because it's not going to happen. They're saying, hey, we, we can make the deal work at $200,000, but it's still a lot of legwork that has to get done because there's some other things that have to be determined, right? So 
When that gets communicated back to the realtor, the realtor is going to start to show the potential client or show the client all of the potential houses that they can purchase. So when they're showing them the potential house within this price range, right, once they find a house, simultaneously the lender is going to be working with the member to find out, okay, what type. So let's, let's go to the next step. So this is when you get into the types of loans. What type of loan? Type of loan, I'm going to just put type loan, and then slash, um, we'll just say, uh, down payment assistance programs. So y'all got to excuse my right, down payment assistance. Right? Because you have some programs, so then when we get into the type of loan, that's when you start getting into the down payment. Is it going to be FHA? Is it going to be VA? Is it going to be conventional? Is it going to be non-conventional? Is it going to be a jumbo loan? Will you require some type of down payment assistance program that's going to help you with the down payment? Do you need to have a program that's going to assist you with closing costs? Now we're going to start looking at, you know, what your reserves are. How much money do you have to put into the deal? Do you have, you know, if you only got three and a half percent, because a lot of loans you can get it at that amount. Or do you have to put 10% into the deal or 5%? All of that's going to be, we're going to start to work those numbers out. And... Also, we're going to start looking at your financial data to see how much you can literally pay for. Now, here's a little trick that banks do, and, and this is something that I've shown you before on the Daily Bread Show, but I'm going to show you again. I'm going to put a little asterisk right here. Now, this number could be a real tricky number, and the reason you have to be really paying attention when they say, hey, you approved for $200,000, right? But this number, this number is calculated off of your gross mm -hmm. income. So I'm gonna just pause there for a moment, make you marinate on that. This is your gross income. Why is that important? That's important because of this. Say if you make $100,000, right? I'm gonna just say 100 so that way we can use round numbers. Mm -hmm. Say if you're, you, you make a, or that family household is $100,000. If you're in a, let's say, 40% tax bracket, right? 40% of 100,000 is 40,000. That means your tax liability is 40,000. That means the amount of money that they're going to take out of your payroll income is 40,000. That means that when you finish with that, you only have $60,000 left, mm -hmm. right? That's 60,000 and 100,000, that's two different numbers. Two big different numbers, 60 and 100. Two totally different numbers. Now, the next thing you want to keep in mind is this. That's just federal tax. Mm -hmm. But in the state of Georgia, I think we're on 6%, right? So now if you take 6% of 100, what's that? That's 6,000. So now you got to take 6,000 off the 60. Now you're down to 54,000. Mm -hmm. So now, when you're doing this $200,000 math, right? It's the same thing. It's the exact same thing. So if you you taking out, you paying forty percent, it's not gonna be, it's not the two hundred thousand. You got to make sure that you understand your net income because once they calculate your mortgage out on this two hundred thousand, because they gonna look at things like what type of loan and what type of interest rate can you get, right? So based on your interest rate, that's what's gonna let you know what your note is. Now, once you find out what your note is, you need to know your budget. And this is where a lot of people get in trouble, right between these, these two steps right here. They fine with getting with the realtor, no problem with that. They fine looking at the house. They fine even with getting a pre-qualification letter. Sometimes they get a little, it gets a little shaky when, when the realtor says, no, I want a pre-approval letter. Because some realtors are real, you know, specific about what they will and what they will not accept. So they may need a pre-approval letter. So they pull your credit. You may have something that's, you know, recently added to your credit, something that may have pulled your score down, or a lot of people don't even know what their score is when they get into this process. They don't even know what their credit score is. So a lot of times they start to find that out right in this these two steps between five and six when you're trying to 
figure out how much you can afford for a house, how much you can get pre-approved or pre-qualified for, and what type of loan, what's your interest rate going to be. But you need to be proactive and make sure you understand your household budget. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have your household budget, and then you add this mortgage into it, you really don't understand the magnitude of calculating debt based on gross income when you pay all your bills and your living expenses off a of net income. So you say you make 100000 in your household, but once you pay your taxes, that's just taxes. So we're not even gonna talk about things that don't show up on your credit report like child care, mm. you gotta eat, food, you got your utilities, you got your uti you got to keep the lights on, the water, mm -hmm. right? You got to cut the yard. Sometimes people need a, you know, you're gonna need a landscaper. So all of these are things that don't show up on your credit report per se, but you have an obligation to it. Auto insurance, right? They're gonna calculate your homeowner's insurance, but all of these are expenses. So if you don't know your budget, you could already be over budget before you even get into this house. But on paper, because of your gross income, you could get the loan, potentially get the loan approved. Now, once you get through this process and they figure out the type of loan, the interest rate, the down payment, then you go to what we call step seven, and this is the closing, right? So everybody's, Everybody's trying to get to the closing. The realtor is trying to get to the closing. Mm -hmm. Because at the closing, the realtor gets paid. The closing attorney is trying to get to the closing. The lender is trying to get to the closing. But to keep in mind, these people, everybody who's working in this process, everybody's looking to get paid. And many times, I'm not saying absolute, but many times when people are going through this process, what happens is the person purchasing, their well-being gets lost in this process because everybody's trying to get to the closing. So nobody's taking this person and saying, yeah, you approved for 200000 mm -hmm. but you really need to be looking at a house in like the $150,000 range because if you get that house at 200000 and I was just talking to a young lady on, um, like, earlier this week, and she's a HUD-approved counselor. And what her company does is they teach, they teach pre-purchase education, post-purchase education, how to avoid foreclosure, financial literacy, credit improvement, Right, and then they also teach classes on the overall homeowner buying process. And here's the thing that she told me, and this is 2019, and this is under this is under the radar because people are not talking about it. The number of people that are going into foreclosure within the first 12 months of home ownership is increasing rapidly. It's increasing rapidly. And you may be saying, well, I ain't heard nothing about, it ain't like 2008 yet, but you have been hearing about a real estate bubble. What's causing that is it's been a, what we call a seller's market, meaning it's not a lot of inventory. So it's just like, it, that's the first rule of business, right? Mm -hmm. Is supply and demand. and demand. So the demand is extremely high. The supply is low. It's not a lot of houses on the market. So what's starting to happen is people are getting approved, they get back to the realtor, the realtor takes them out to see a house. When they go out to see a house, they're like, yeah, I want to get the house. And by the time they put in an offer, they find out the house is already in the contract. So they put the house on the contract. Oh, that was under contract. They go look, I want, what about this one? And, okay, it's not under contract. By the time they contact the other agent, ready to put, it's under contract. So now they get into a, a situation where they start doing what we call backup contracts. The house is under contract, but I'm going to put a backup in case something falls through with the first person, the primary, then you have the opportunity to buy. But it's a frenzy. So what ends up happening is 
people end up buying the house. They finally get the house, but they get to that two hundred thousand. They haven't looked at their budget. They can't. And then once they get into the house, here's the thing about looking at and listening to the Daily Bread Show, right? This this information could save your financial life. So listen to what I'm going to share with you. When you buy a house, there are expenses that go along with buying a house that most people, especially when it's their first time buying a house, they don't think about that, right? That's where the phrase comes from, you know, house poor, house poor. So what that means is this. Yeah, you was able to purchase the house. Yeah, you were able to get to the closing, right? But as soon as you start, you walk into the house, it's like, need some curtains. Like right off the bat, like, oh, how do you think? You need, no, not only do you need curtains, you need curtains for every room. Oh, okay. You may need fixtures. Depending on what type of house. It might be a brand new house. Okay, so you don't need fixtures. You don't have to change the locks. Okay, you got to change them. Okay, you got to do that. Now, you need to have some reserve money set aside in the event that something happens. And you might be saying, well, what's going to happen? It's a brand new house. When you buy a house, anything can happen. Anything. Furnace might go out. Oh, well, I got a, um, a homeowner's you know, appliance warranty. Okay, that's fine. But those come with a deductible. You have homeowner's insurance, but a lot of homeowner insurance policies are written with a four or $5,000 deductible. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? That means this. If you have a homeowner insurance policy and something happens to your house unexpectedly, right? The condenser unit is on the second floor. It backs up. It starts to overflow water. You're out of town and the water starts to overflow from your unit, it goes from your upstairs to your downstairs. So you come back, now you got a leak, you see the way it's been leaking through the roof, or flooded your basement, you're like, okay, I need to get carpet replaced, I need to tear the walls out, I need to do all of this different stuff, a pipe burst, oh, okay. Anything can happen when you have a house. Now your deductible is $4,000, but you just bought the house. You have no reserves. You have no money saved, right? So when you reach out to your insurance company and say, hey, you know, we had a leak, something overflowed, we need to get this, they're going to send out an adjuster, an appraiser, actually. They send out the claims adjuster and appraiser. They come out, they're going to look at the damage, and they're going to give you an estimate of how much it's going to cost to repair it. Now here's the thing. If they say it's going to cost $3,000 to repair, no, better yet, $3,500 to repair, right? But your deductible is $4,000, guess what? Your homeowners don't pay. They don't only pay once you get above the deductible. Once you pay the deductible, anything above that, they're going to pay for. Anything below that, that's on you. So what happens if you don't have $3,000? Where, I, I mean, just a big question mark. Like, what happens if you don't have $3,000? That's when you, your friends, your family, your parents, you know, somebody close to you, hey, you, now you, you just brought the house. So people will be like, man, you just brought that house. You what? what? Uh, what are, are you leaving unrepaired? And people go, what happened to the ceiling? What, what's up with that? What's up with the ceiling? Oh, you know, you still got to go to work. You still got to eat. You still got to pay the utilities. So the moral of the story is, before you even get into this process, the mortgage process, you should know your, you should have a household budget and you should know how much money you can allocate to purchasing a home. And it don't just happen when you do first time, because you would think like, oh, I brought a house once, it can happen when you go from like, oh, my first house was 200000 been working for a while, now you're going after the dream house. Mm. You go to the mortgage company, the mortgage company say, oh, man, you've been doing good, you've been working hard, your new house, now your new house, we're going to change this number, we're going to make this a bigger number. Your new house is, because you ready for that, that nice one, right? Ready to retire, 
$500,000. Get you a nice $500,000 house. The same thing applies. The same process. Realtor. Realtor's going to ask you, are you pre-approved? No. Pre-qual other? No. They're going to send you to a lender. You're going to reach out to JL Capital. Reach out to us, jlcapital.com, or you can give us a call. We're going to get you a pre-qualification letter. We're going to take you through all those steps. We're going to verify your income. We're going to verify your taxes, three years of tax returns. We're going to look at your, your uh, payment, three months of payment stubs, recent payment stubs. We're going to look at how long you've been in that industry. We're going to look at your credit score. We're going to start getting all of that stuff lined up for the underwriter, send it to the underwriter. We're going to take you through. We're going to determine what type of loan. Now you get into the $500,000 range, now you're going to need a jumbo loan because that's above the conventional limits. So now you're getting into a jumbo loan. You go into that process. But here's the thing. Now you get the $500,000 house with the pool in the back. Big house, right? What, four or 500,000 square feet? That's a big no, house. hundred square feet. Four or 5,000 square feet. That's a big house. That's a big house, right? That's a big house. So guess what? When you buy, when you, <laughs> so once you, once you get your, money, ain't got no furniture. Look, <laughs> I gotta say now when you, <laughs> ain't got no you got you can't, <laughs> you gotta be prepared because look, now you got the house with them tall windows, mm -hmm. with the tall, so you can't go buy the little regular. <laughs> The little regular curves, you got to have somebody come in. It's gonna cost you. And, and custom make you some drapes. You know, because you ain't gonna be able to get the 60 inch and the 70 inch. They, they like two stories. You're gonna have to get the big long drapes. And then what else you gonna you gonna need to get the furniture? Mm. You're gonna have to furnish everything in the house. Ain't gonna be no furniture. Every room. Right? So you cause it ain't gonna be cool. You ain't gonna be able to put the, the mattress, you know, on the floor. You ain't gonna be able to do the outdoor furniture, you know, and it's like, so one has to go with the other one. Same thing can happen. You can get into trouble real quick. You know, you got a $2,000 note or a $2,500 note or a $3,000 note. Looks good while you're working. Looks bad when something happens and you don't have any reserves. So for me, this is the more, this is the high level. This is the mortgage process. Contact the realtor. Realtor's going to tell you to contact a lender, get you a pre-qualification letter, pre-approval letter. You're going to let the lender know, and the lender is going to um, let the realtor know how much you're qualified for. Mm -hmm. You're going to go out, you're going to find that property. They're going to start to work on the type of loan. That's step five, right? We're going to start looking at the type of loan. How much do you have to put down? Another thing, too, that a lot of times people don't realize, but this comes up, too, before you get to the closing. Many lenders don't want to know how much money do you have in reserves. They want to know that because they're going to calculate that into what you can afford. But that's not going to come. That's going to come at the very end, right when you get ready to go to closing. So sometimes you, they, they want to see $2,500 in savings. They want to see $3,500 in savings. Yeah, it could be a gift. Depending on the type of loan that you have, they want to because they want to see the same thing. They want to make sure that you don't get into this house and you got three hundred dollars in savings, mm. or five hundred dollars in savings, and right off the bat you at risk. Mm. So sometimes they ask you about reserves, and if you don't have the reserves, you can't close the loan. Then you get down to the closing. Everybody get paid at the closing, but the thing to keep in mind is this. You have to be proactive and have your own household budget with all of your expenses already listed out, all of your obligations, because some of the things that you, because you still got to calculate all your other bill and liabilities into this new house payment. So you still may have a car note and you still got your car insurance and you still may have kids in college with tuition. Tuition don't show up. The, tuition don't show up in your calculation when you get ready to get a loan. But it's an obligation. So don't try to cheat them and think like, hey, well, I, I ain't going to tell them. I know I got to pay, you know, tuition, they down to such and such. And I, I won't, you know, and the, and the person in this process is, oh, you ain't got to put that on there. They ain't on your credit report. But you know you got an obligation to pay the tuition. Mm -hmm. So what, what I'm saying is the moral of the story is we have to be good stewards of how we manage our 
financial well-being, meaning, i.e., you need to have a budget, your own budget, before you even start this process, and then you will know exactly what you can and can't do. Just because you approve for five hundred thousand, that you may not want to get a five hundred thousand. You may want to say, you know what? I know we approve for five hundred. Why don't we get a three fifty? If it, we it'd be just as nice, might you know we need to take a little look around. Maybe we, hey, and and we'll have some reserves, and we'll still be able to save. Cause that's the other thing. If you buy too much house, what happens to your ability to save? If you can't save money but you got a house, it, it don't work that way. It's more important to have savings and something that you can, in the event that you're gonna have a rainy day and it rains every day somewhere. Mm -hmm. So you need to prepare for that. You need to be prepared for in the event something doesn't go according to plan and you don't have to get into a financial crisis. Now you're trying to pay everything on a credit card or get a cash advance on a credit card. Now your credit card's up. So if your credit card's up, what does that mean? Your utilization is up. So what does that mean? Exactly. That means your score is going down. You money exactly. And when your score is going down, guess what? Now you want, you want to go out and try to borrow some more money can't borrow no more money, just bought a house, and your score is down. Why? Because your credit card utilization is up. So you got to be able to learn how to read all these different keys, right? It's just like it's football season now, right? So a good analogy is if you play offense or defense, you have to be able to read your keys, right? So if he lines up over here in the slot, then you know they may be getting ready to run a jet sweep. Mm -hmm. if, he, if he lines up tight, they may be getting ready to just run the ball. They may be trying to get impact. But you got to learn how to read your financial keys as well. So even though you're going through this process, and it should be a very, very happy time, joyous, you should be glad, like, oh, we finally getting us a crib. And by no means am I saying, oh, am I discouraging the home buying? I'm a big proponent of the home buying process. But I'm a bigger proponent of self-preservation. I'm a bigger proponent of that. Self-preservation, meaning you prepare to be successful. Don't show up like, okay, I'm ready. No, you prepare to be successful. So they shouldn't be pulling your credit, telling you, oh, you got a 650. You should already know, I, I got a 650. Why? Because I don't look that. I don't went to Credit Karma or Credit Sesame, or I don't looked at pull my Equifax report myself. I don't went to annualcreditreport.com. I reviewed. I know my score. You should know all of that before you even get into this process. Mm -hmm. So that way they're not telling you or they don't come to you and say, oh, we, we could have got you a better term, but your score wasn't as strong. Like, what? Mm -hmm. You already know your score. You should already be, count, be able to calculate your debt to income ratio. Debt, DTI for short. You should you could calculate that yourself. But in order for you to calculate it, guess what? You have to add up all of those liabilities, put a slash over all of your income. That's your debt to income ratio. And many times with these loans, they want to see anything 45% or lower. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'll let you go a little bit above 45%, depending on the type of loan, depending on the situation. But most times they want you to be at 45% or lower. Why? Because then that's when you get into a red zone. Anything above 40, that means over half of your, half of your income already going somewhere, and now you're going to add another liability on top of that. So you have to be very, very savvy in how you manage your money. And, what you, and, and the good thing about JL Capital, you go through this process, we're going to make sure that we're cognizant with you. We're not going to just give you any type of loan. We're not going to just put you in anything just to get to the closing so that we make money. We're looking for lifelong customers. We're looking for people that, you know, the mom and the dad are buying the house. When the kids become of age, they use us for the kids. When they get ready to refinance their house, they come back and use us again. When they're ready to buy some investment property, they come back and use us again. They telling a friend about us. They telling the people at church. So we're going to make sure that we that's one of our primary goals is to provide top-notch customer service because most deals are lost because a lot of people can do a loan. So don't get me wrong. A lot of banks can do a loan. It's the customer service. 
it's the customer service that you extend to a person that they remember. Like Maya Angelou say, right? That's one of her quotes. People may forget what you said to them. People may forget what you did to them, but people will never, ever forget how you made them feel. So if you make a customer feel good about the process, you educate them all the way through the process, when it's time to do it again, they want to do it again with you, right? That becomes a lifelong customer. So we're not looking for the quick hit, hey, I close, hey, I close. I'm like, I want you to be good. I want you to understand the process. I want you to understand what these numbers are that they throwing at you. I want you to understand why you got these numbers. If you got questions, we're going to work through those. And sometimes you may even have to step back because you may go through this whole process and get to a point and say, I can't, I can't do it right now. And there's nothing wrong with that. I ain't ready. Right? You, you may not be ready. And there's nothing wrong with that. Don't feel the pressure like, oh, I got to do it. Like, self-preservation. Self-preservation is more important than saving face. Or, I don't want to be shamed. You will be shamed if the people come and something goes you know, awry and you start having stress for trying to make a mortgage. That, you will be shamed. So self-preservation from a financial standpoint is number one. And JL Capital, we're going to take care of it. So that, that was one of the big whys, because people kept asking me, like, why, why did you start a mortgage company? Why did you? Because historically, in our community, when we apply for a mortgage, when we apply for a car loan, if you're not approved, they don't tell you why. Mm -hmm. They don't tell you why. If you go to buy a car, you can go to a dealership the day or tomorrow. They're going to let you drive it. When they pull your credit mm -mm. and they find that they can't do a deal for you, at that point, they just say, you're not approved. Or your score, they'll say, your score wasn't where we thought it was going to be. What that means is your score wasn't where they could manipulate the deal in such a way that they could make a profit. They can, more than likely, they can still do the deal, but it won't be no profit in it for them because they have to go with a, you know, a lower tier lender that may be charging a higher interest rate, and that's going to eat up some of their profit. So they just say, we just can't do the deal. So what I want to do is put myself in position so that way anybody in our community that wanted to get a loan, wants to get into a house, we still got a lot of people that are renting, that could be buying houses. I talked to a, a gentleman the other day. He said he's paying like twelve hundred dollars in rent. He's rent, he's leasing an apartment, paying twelve hundred dollars. I'm like, bro, you come out better just buying you a little, and it's just you, just you come out better just buying you a little, you know, a little starter house. Yeah. But I don't want no starter house. I'm like, you would come out much better just buying you a little starter house. Get out of that mindset that you need to be, you know, in a certain area and you need a pool. Because when you start buying things. You start generating equity. And when you start generating equity, then you start putting yourself in a position where you can do bigger deals, do bigger things to help your family out and start creating some generational wealth. Because we got to get away from, you know, just doing things in one lifetime, that person passes away, and then the next generation is starting all over again. We got to start creating some steps so, so our, our kids and our kids' kids will have the opportunity to step on top of what we've done and go up and not be like, you know, going in a, a cyclical, you know, fashion. So that's really why I started the, you know, the mortgage company. I think it's going to be extremely successful. I already getting a lot of people that have interest in it. And uh, it's something that I'm just taking it out to the world, I'm taking it to schools, taking it to teachers, taking it to veterans, taking it to, the, you know, seniors. I mean, anybody that wants to have a conscientious lender, then they're going to, you know, look for us. And once you have good customer service, people talk about it. Mm -hmm. People are going to talk about it. You got reviews, you got social media. So the playing field is somewhat, you know, level in a sense where you can compete with the big boys, but it's going to take some work. It's going to take some work, but with social media and other, you know, the digital age that you have now, you can do, a little, you can do your own little ads. The only thing you need is, you know, Nice little camera, you know, put something out, do your ad, boom, post it, and just, but you gotta be diligent about it. So that's what I wanted to do tonight. Let's cover the process. That's high level, just one through seven.
But many people don't even understand this process. Many people are getting caught up in different areas in this process. But um, as long as you understand the process, you're going through it, and just like anything else, you can just practice. Maybe you're not, maybe you're not ready to buy a house just yet, but you can still start going through this process so you can practice, right? You can practice and know how you need to do it, what you need to do, which way you need to, you know, structure the deal, um, who's a good, you know, realtor, what's a good part of town, you know, what are the houses going for where you want to stay. You could be doing that. You don't have to wait till you, you know, got everything and start getting your down payment together, mm -hmm. right? And that's something that we taught maybe two weeks ago on the Daily Bread Show, right? If you start saving, you know, what did we say? A dollar a day? A dollar a day. Right? Yep. We said a dollar, no, we said a dollar, we start off a dollar a week and then increase it. Work it up. Right? Mm -hmm. Every week you go up by one. So this week you save a dollar, next week you save two dollars, next week you, by the time you get to the 52nd week you have $1,350. That's a lot of money. Right? So you, you almost did. So you do that again, you do it a second year, now you're at 26. You, you got your down payment. Right? You got your down payment off a dollar a week. And you just keep doing that process. So that's what you want to do. And home ownership is the key to getting you into real estate. It's the key to having an asset that you can pass on to your kids. It's the key to help you get into a stronger financial position. Because once you pay your house off, you know, some it's different proponents. Some people say, don't pay the house off. You'll never get the money out of this. It's different things. Okay, that's fine. But to each his own. I always tell people to each his own. Some people want to pay their house off, be done with it. Some people are like, I don't even want to pay my house off because the money is going to be stuck in the house and the only way I can get it out is I got to get a home equity line of credit or a home equity loan or I got to sell my house. That's why I always tell people to each his own. You do what's best for your financial situation, but buying a house is much more advantageous than renting an apartment, especially over time. Because what people are telling you is this, like you could just rent. It ain't no, you ain't no need you buying no house. It's, you know, you paying a little more, but somebody come in, they'll fix your drain, they'll fix anything that's broken. But the biggest thing that you lose when you're renting versus buying is equity over time. Exactly. It's equity over time. It's equity over time because if you're paying that lease month in, month out, year in, year out, over 10 years, over 15 years, you could have been building equity into a house. Mm -hmm. You could, and it don't have to be a, you know, a really super good, nice house, but you could be any kind of house. 15 years, you've built some equity in that house. Because you're going to pay down the principal and the house is going to appreciate. That's the bottom line. So as we're looking at the Fed, mortgage rates are down. They're at an all-time low. If you're in a position to refinance or purchase a home or purchase another home, this is the time to do it. Yeah. This is the time to do it. A lot of people are talking about the president. They don't like him doing this. He's doing that. But one thing everybody can agree on, the economy has been pretty, pretty strong. So, whether you like them, don't like them, just do what's best for you. You gonna vote for them? Oh man, that's a loaded question. I don't, I don't think, I still don't think, I don't know man. I don't do politics on the Daily Bread Show. I just don't, I mean, I, I don't know man, I'm, I'm, I don't know. It's just so, it's messy. I mean, we got three minutes left, so let me, see that brings us right to the book of the week. And perfect segue to the book of the week. You couldn't ask the question at a better time, right? This book is a must for anybody that wants to get educated. This is this is the miseducation of the Negro by Carter G. Woodson, and the miseducation of the Negro by Carter G. Woodson is a book that tells you about understanding the mindset of African Americans when you've been conditioned by someone that's an oppressor. So if somebody's an oppressor and 
they're trying to educate you, then that's a problem. Because then you start to take on their traits and you start to take on things that they have without understanding why you're doing it. But you're doing that out of, you know, not knowing. But they understand you. So this book by Carter G. Woodson, it talks about not being conditioned to the point where you don't even ask questions. You just do it because you feel like that's the way it's supposed to be done because that's the way that somebody that was an oppressor have taught you or conditioned you to think. So I'm going to just read a quick little excerpt from the back cover. It says, when you, and this is deep, it said, when you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. Just that one sentence alone, that's crazy, right? When you control, listen to this, when you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. You do not have to tell him not to stand here or to go yonder. He will find his proper place and will stay in it. Mm. You do not need to send him to the back door. He will go without being told. In fact, if there is no back door, he will cut one mm. for his special benefit. His education makes it necessary. History shows us that it does not matter who is in power. Those who have not learned to do for themselves, Daily Bread Show, those who have not learned to do for themselves and have to depend solely on others never obtain any more rights or privileges in the end than they did in the beginning. Now that's deep. That, I, I, I think, man, I got to read that one more time. Just let that, you got to marinate on this. History shows that it does not matter who is in power. Those who have not learned to do for themselves and have to depend solely on others never obtain any more rights or privileges in the end than they did in the beginning. That's so if you haven't read, I mean if you if you've never read The Miseducation of the Negro, or if you've read it before. It, it's, it's one of those type of books where you can go back and read it again, and I promise you, you'll get something out of it. So we're at the top of the hour. Tremendous show. Mortgage process. Check us out, jlcapital.com. We're doing mortgages. We're doing business loans. We're doing investment loans. We're doing residential. Tell a friend. Tell a family member. Tell a church member. Hey, we, we have someone in the African-American community that has integrity that you can trust. That's going to be quality customer service. So make sure you spread the word, let people know. Um, you can reach out to us on social media or, or via the website. You can leave questions, concerns, comments, anything on the website. And we'll follow up with you because it comes right through to our email. And we'll follow up with you. So, so let us know if we can help you out. So you all have a great week. Have a great weekend. We'll see you all. Hey, stay, next week, we're going to have an outstanding show. We're going to have a brother that's one of the, he was one of the first producers for Sean P. Diddy Combs. This brother wrote some of the biggest hits for uh, Biggie Smalls, Mace, Faith Evans, and a whole bunch of other entertainers. And he was my roommate in college. So I'm going to bring him on to the show next week. He's a dynamic brother, has a great story, just released a book, and his name is Mr. Ron Lawrence. So we're going to bring Ron on next week. I'm going to have him call into the show. And he gonna tell his story. We gonna we gonna learn some more about the music industry. Oh, you like that show, there, man? That thing is just that show. That, hey, that thing is just no group. Hey, but y'all make sure y'all have a good week. Stay on top of your game. Hey, take your blinders off. Make sure you're up on it. And uh, we'll see y'all next week. Same time, same channel. Hey. I eat. Don't you do the microphone?